This episode of Advocates, the podcast, is supported by Taylor's Law School, where you master the skills, tactics, and ethics that these top advocates will be talking about. Listen to the voices of the advocates. Hello, listeners. Welcome to Advocates, the podcast. The phrase multitasking could have been specially created for our next guest. She was the president of the Malaysian Bar. She was also the head of Bursi, an electoral reform group. And as head of these two bodies, she persuaded the notoriously apathetic members of the Malaysian Bar to march on at the nation's capital against interference in the appointment of judges. As head of Bursi, she cajoled and persuaded 100,000 Malaysians to rally peacefully in the nation's capital of Kuala Lumpur in support of electoral reforms, whilst at the same time being counsel of choice in administrative and constitutional cases and her specialty, intellectual property. Welcome, Ambiga Srinivasan. Morning, Ambi. Good morning. Hi. All right. I'll just start off with this, actually. I know you came from, in your own words, a relatively prosperous middle-class background. Your dad was a surgeon, your mother was a homemaker. You're a Brahmin, absolutely and totally middle class. So could I just start off by saying, where did this rebellious streak of yours come from? Okay, uh, first of all, they're not my own words, okay? <laughs> <Right now. laughs> no. um, yeah, where did the rebellious streak come from? My, my father was quite the rebel, actually, in his time. He stood up to authority in, at his place of work. He also took his being a citizen very, very seriously. Now, you must understand that his generation is the uh, Merdeka generation, uh, lived through the Japanese times, saw Merdeka. So when they were called to serve the country by the Tumpu, they took it very seriously. So that's the generation we're talking about. I also recall that one, one day he was poring over the Kuala Lumpur development plans. Uh, basically, he wanted to give his view on the development in Kuala Lumpur. And, and he did that. So he, he took his role as a citizen very seriously. For him, he had a very high sense of duty. So being a rebel was really not very difficult for him. So I suppose that's where it comes from. <laughs> okay, right. So, Ambi, you grew up in Kuala Lumpur. As you said earlier, your, your dad was a doctor. He was a surgeon, in fact. Your mom a homemaker. And you got two other siblings, one of whom is here today, Gopal, and your elder sister is a teacher. What was your childhood like? Early life then? Family home? Family home. In the 70s? Yeah. Oh, aha. no, it goes back a bit further than that. But I think we were very lucky growing up, actually. Okay. We had wonderful parents and we had an extended family. So we were, in fact, quite privileged, actually, growing up. Um, we had a comfortable life. Uh, and we were all able to pursue whatever we wanted, basically, by way of uh, activities that we did, professions that we wanted to join. So I think, you know, we really were a typical middle class family, as it were, if you want to call it that way. Yeah. You went to Convent Bukit Nanas. Yes. And you were hit girl, hit prefect in 1975. Uh, what, what do you recall of your school days? Were you active in sports and all that? I was very active in school. In fact, I, I remember my mum saying that perhaps uh, I should stay and sleep in school because I spent so much time there. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I, I took part in many activities, uh, in, uh, in games, in, uh, in the debating team, in drama, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, I was very active in school. And thereafter, of course, you went off to Exeter to read law. Before that, could I ask, what made you decide to read law? Well, I suppose at school, I was in the school debating team. And I know it doesn't necessarily follow that you should do law because of that. But I also realized in the fifth form that I was more interested in the arts. So I actually switched to the arts in form six. And I was delighted with uh, studying literature and history and that kind of thing. So, you see, I suppose in those days and in my own mind, um, there were only three professions that were possible, okay? okay. Which is either you do medicine, 
you do law right. or you become an accountant. Right. So I suppose, if it, you know, given my background, law just appealed to me and I have no regrets. I had regrets in the middle of my course at the, in Exeter, but after coming out and practicing, I have absolutely no regrets. So w- why do you say you had some regrets when in the middle of your course in Exeter? Did you find that particularly difficult? <laughs> Uh, well, you know, it, it was it, that time of your life when actually you, you, you leave home for the first time, you go there, uh, things are so different. So I suppose a, a lot of it was also homesickness and things like that. So why it wasn't, I didn't think it was particularly difficult, but it was just at some point you wonder whether you're doing the right course, you know, because you're committing to it for the rest of your life is how I looked at it. Well, as, as you just said, just now you left home thousand of miles away, going off to a strange new alien environment. What's the greatest difference that you find in England compared to in KL in Malaysia? Oh, uh, for me, it was the freedom to speak, actually, freedom of speech mm-hmm. and freedom to think. And, and people dared to, to think differently. Uh, it was also the inclusiveness in the UK. But again, it is, it is mainly that people valued your opinions, you know, because you were young, people didn't say, no, no, you shouldn't have a point of view or it's not important. We were really taught to think. And because you are mixing, and this is any university, not necessarily overseas, because you are mixing with other students of different disciplines, it opens up a huge horizon for you. So it's that. It's about university life. Being overseas, I suppose you just saw things differently. Uh, it's an education in itself, leaving home and going overseas. So, yeah. Yeah, because, you know, in the current times we live in, a lot of the universities are reopening, but we're having virtual classes and all that. I was just wondering the impact on undergraduates there. What are your thoughts? On that? Well, I mean, um, you know what? It's inevitable. It's something that we have to deal with. But what you miss, actually, is the personal contact. I don't know whether, you know, you can read facial expressions virtually as well as you can in person. Uh, You know, things like that. You you miss out the human element. It's not bad because at least you can reach out to people. But I think uh, you lose a lot, unfortunately, in this virtual climate. Yes. Coming back to your narrative, so to speak, you you graduated. uh, You did the bar at Grace Inn. You were called to the English and Welsh Bar in 1980. And then you, you came back home to chamber yes. uh, to do your preparation screen and co. Uh, who was your master? Um, Chen Kaling, actually. She's re- more or less retired now, but Miss Chen Kaling, right. who was in the corporate department, actually. She was my master. So how did you get into screen? Well, my family knew Stanley Petty, who was a senior partner in screen. And my father saw him and asked if they would accept me as a chairman student. And that's how I got in, actually. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Unfortunately, it, wasn't, it was not difficult. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. So, uh, yeah, and then you were saying your master was Ms. Chan Kaling, who was doing corporate matters and all that. But you end up doing litigation, yeah? Yes. Although your master was in a particularly different area of law, how did that work? Well, you know, we were getting briefs from all the partners in screen. Mm -hmm. And I was very lucky at that time because we had some excellent up and coming uh, litigators in the firm. Tommy Thomas was there, Vinay Pradhan, uh, and there were so many who were ready to use us and and to give us work, you know. So litigation was always what I wanted to do. There was no doubt in my mind about that. All right. So as a young lawyer, you started off, you went to courts. So you, you started at the very bottom, at the magistrate's court? Or you straight away was sent to do high court matters and all that? Okay, I started at the magistrate's court. Right, okay. And and I started in the industrial court. Oh, I see. uh, Those are amazing experiences because in the lower courts, people shouldn't look down on the lower court, by the way, because that's where you get your trial experience. Mm -hmm. Uh, Almost immediately, I got trial experience in, in the industrial court. And uh, and I did some family work, let me tell you. And the, the good thing about that is, I don't do it anymore, but the good thing about that is I got immediate access to the high court ah. to do trials and to do hearings and to do applications. So that was quite a mixed bag for me. Of course, I did the run-of-the-mill commercial cases as well. But I do recall that in my fourth year as a legal assistant, Tommy Thomas, who was a partner and he w- who was busy in uh, doing the Bank Bumiputra case, 
He threw a file at me and said, this is a federal court matter, go and argue it. Fourth year, okay? <laughs> okay. Now, I wasn't going to say no. No way was I going to say no. So I said yes. And of course, I was actually petrified for the next few days <laughs> preparing for that. But of course, the good thing is it, it wasn't such a strong case. And it was just uh, sometimes it's good to start on not so strong cases because then if you lose, you don't feel so bad. So uh, I did that. And that was the NST case. And of course, I lost on the facts. But the law developed there, you know, in relation to ouster clauses. So that was quite a quite an interesting administrative law case that I did. It was an it was an industrial relations one, but also administrative law. No, but as a young lawyer, you also said you you had trial experiences at the lower court and also at the high court. You did family law. Did you find that particular area of the law particularly, you know, stressful or challenging? You know, husband and wife fighting custody of children. How do you manage to do that as a relatively inexperienced counsel? Yeah, it was not easy, let me tell you. But a lot of it is fact-based, but it could be very challenging. And it was also sometimes a drain on your own emotions because because it is emotional. And and I recall in one instance, it was a very bitter fight between husband and wife. And I actually got threats at home. Uh, my father got a phone call and uh, the husband was threatened, threatened me and said, you know, basically... I'm going to throw her into the Klang River or something like that, tell her to watch it, that kind of a threat. Um, But I remember that when we went to court, so the minute that happened, I got a senior partner in and I said, look, you better do this. So when the matter came up for hearing, it was reported to the court that this is what had happened. And I remember Justice Elsie Vora, and he gave the husband such a dressing down, (laughs) actually. So it it, it, it isn't unusual, But the courts are very tough on situations like that and protective of the legal profession if any of those things happen. So that was one of the things. So anyway, yes, you're right. It can be very, very draining emotionally. And after a while, I pulled out of family law, I think probably for that very reason. (laughs) Okay, right. Because I was just going through your biography, you then actually end up doing intellectual property, which I think at that time was a fairly new area of the law. So how did Ambika Srinivasan, civil lawyer, so to speak, end up doing intellectual property? Seems to be like a dry area of law for me, to be honest. Oh, it's not. You know, being in a big firm, obviously, we had several departments, okay? You have the corporate, you have the uh, banking department and litigation and so on. So intellectual property was a department in itself. And within that, you had, okay, you had all the registration and that's the dry area, Razlan. The registrations and so on and so so forth. But there was also a growing need for an intellectual property litigator. So that's where I came into the picture. I said, right, why not? Let me, let me try this, you know. And I tell you, intellectual property is a vast area, okay? There's intellectual property from a pin to a spaceship, okay? The intellectual property rights can be engaged at every level. And, and in fact, I, I was delighted to learn about the best kept trade secret, which is the Coca-Cola recipe, by the way. So these are the things. So that's confidential information, okay? That's another area of law. That's not dry, okay? Rajan, that's not dry. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, hang on, hang on, hang on. Sorry, I got to explore this. Are you telling me you know the Coca-Cola recipe? Of course not. It's the best kept trade secret. No one except for very few know it. <laughs> <laughs> So, but there you are. That's another area of law, you see, that's related. Confidential information and trade secrets and so on. Formula and stuff like that. Pattern. So, quite a vast area. I have no regrets doing uh, intellectual property. I still do. But yes. I also do other, other work, of course. Of course. Uh, and we'll talk about that a bit later. But, you know, after about almost 10 years of screen, I mean, more than 10 years from 91, in 2002, you went off and formed your own firm, Srinivasan. What was that experience, particularly in the first few years? Was it particularly challenging? You were a particularly senior lawyer at the time. So I suppose you had your pool of clients. Yes, it was. Of course, it's always a challenge, but it's something completely new. Uh, It is very different from a large firm. I remember in the firm that I was in, in Screen, you could have partners meetings that run into hours, okay, sometimes, because there's so so many things to deal with. In a small firm, it takes two minutes, especially if you have just one other partner, you walk into a room, which I used to do, 
And then we say, all right, can we do it this way? So right. your time spent on your work, I think, is possibly a lot more than, you know, in, in a large firm. Of course, now large firms have different ways of operating. So that may not be true anymore. It's very challenging, very challenging to persuade clients that you, you know, that, that you don't need the big firm backing because in those days, the big firms, you know, uh, people trusted because they felt that they had the resources and the backing and so on. So when you're on your own, trying to run more of a council type practice, then of course, that's not so difficult. But then there is reliance, of course, on solicitors more of a reliance on solicitors to give you briefs because you want to do more of a council type practice. Uh, that was what uh, we wanted to be. Oh. So although we do some solicitors work, it's mainly, you know, a council type practice. A boot, what they call, I don't like the word very much, don't get me wrong, a boutique. At that time, a boutique firm, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> and that seems, to have, that seems to have taken root, actually. I, I can see quite a lot of that going on. Yeah. Yes, I think so. I don't know whether these firms are really boutique or not, but they like to describe themselves as such, yes. you know. Okay. I've got to just slightly pivot now to a different aspect of your advocacy in non-governmental work. Because I read an interview you had with the New York Times where you said you do not describe yourself as an activist. You said, I think I am an advocate for a cause. And of course, famously, you are, you was the leader of Berse, the coalition of non-governmental organizations asking for electoral reforms in our country. You were also a president of Malaysian Bar for two years in 2007, 2009. And all these things that happened during your presidency and during your leadership of Berse. And I'm just wondering here, coming back to that quote, how is your experience as an advocate, I suppose, prepared you or results in you approaching that particular role as president of the Malaysian Bar and as leader of, of Bursay? Okay, there are two different kinds of advocacy completely. I call the Bursay advocacy street advocacy, okay? Okay. Right. And it's this, but don't get me wrong, my experience as an advocate, my experience in formulating arguments based on fact and law is what truly, truly informed the way I led per se and helped. Because when you argue on facts and the law, then it is very difficult for your detractors to attack you. And I realized that that is important. And I, I hope that was something I brought into the activism of per se. Now, street advocacy, as I call it, is different because very often when you're speaking to those at the rally, you're speaking to the converted. So you have to be punchy, you have to be short, you have to be crystal clear and extremely simple and straightforward. You cannot speak to 100,000 people and, and talk about law and the, you know, the constitution necessarily and so on, unless it's in, uh, you know, soundbite. But it is still a matter of persuasion because you also want to persuade the detractors. You want to bring more people on board with your cause. So there is an art to that persuasion. So I did find that, okay, on the streets is a different form of advocacy. Doing interviews, you have to be much more welcoming, you know, in the way you put forward your ideas, because the idea is to bring more people on board. So th that is the difference between the two types of advocacy, I suppose, uh, with some sim clear similarities. I see. So when you let the, uh... The Malaysian bar from March 2007 to March 2009. I mean, I suppose one of the most seminal moments in the hist long history of the Malaysian bar is the walk for justice. With you organized 5,600, 5 to 6,000 of us walking through the streets of Putrajaya, protesting against a video clip that showed a, a lawyer brokering the appointment of a judge. That is a sight I will never forget seeing 5,000, 6,000 lawyers all dressed up in suits walking in the sweltering tropical heat of Malaysia. And after that, being faced with one of the most massive thunderstorms ever <laughs> that I can recall, oh, and all of us were drenched. So what made you decide, you know, when you saw that clip, enough is enough. We can't just send another memorandum to the government. we got to do this. we got to go down to the streets. And you got to get lawyers going down to the streets. How do you do that, Andy? Why and how do you do that? I suppose. All right. For starters, it's not the first time lawyers went to the streets. If you remember the case of the 42 lawyers who were charged in 
many, many years ago against the Societies Act. Now, the activism at the bar was amazing, all right? Uh, if you recall our bar meetings, that's where you had the late, great Karpal Singh speaking, you had Karam Singh speaking, you know, you had people who were inspiring. And the bar always stood for what was right without fear or favour. So uh, coming back to the Walk for Justice, it was such an unacceptable situation because we had gone through several months, you know, and maybe even years of this kind of undermining of judicial independence, that it was intolerable. So at some point, we had to decide, are we going to just, you know, issue statements, memoranda, or are we going to say something more effective? Are we going to do something more effective? So we decided, and to be fair, it was a council decision. We, I had an excellent council. A, a lot of people helped organize it. Roger Tan, through his website, managed to whip up support. And kudos to the lawyers who turned up. I, I remember there was one busload who was stopped quite a distance away from where uh, Putrajaya, where the walk took place. And you know what they did? They got down and they walked all the way from there to where we were and then walked with us <laughs> on the boulevard, you know, along the boulevard. So the lawyers were really, really angry. And I, I knew we had done the right thing when I saw that. Because clearly, when you're fighting for what's right, the lawyers really do rise to the occasion. So that's what happened there. And that's why I feel, and by the way, because of that, I feel it was one of the steps that led towards the setting up of the Judicial Appointments Commission. So something did come out of it. Of course, it didn't just start with that. It was many things. But something did come out of it in the end. So there you are. Yeah. Did you take that experience when you led Bursi? And then you had another huge rally. I don't know why is it with you and rallies. This time, uh, you know, various estimates, but from 50 to 80, I've even read 100,000 people. I mean, I was there myself at the Bursi rallies. And it was massive. And this all came under your leadership. So my question is, how difficult was it to organize such a thing? And you know what? And the thing that I recall about the Bersi rally is that the participants were extremely well behaved, despite provocations by the police at that time, the FRU and all that. But under your leadership, you could then make sure the Joe public goes to these rallies, and we were not used to rallies at that time, and most of us behaved. So how is it you could ensure that, actually? Okay, that is not credit to me, uh, Razlan, but to the activists that I worked with. Uh, Maria, by the way, was instrumental. Maria Chin Abdullah was instrumental in uh, organizing. They were used to doing that. Huh? They did the first per se. I was not part of the first per se. I came in for the second rally. So they already had the experience. Yep. And not only did they have the experience, they had, for example, past party. They had a unit amal, a security detail, as it were. And we kept issuing statements as to how that this was going to be peaceful, this is the, the way we're going to do this. We're not going to accept any violence. Anyone who is violent will have to face the full force of the law. But people were generally well behaved anyway. Not only that, they used to clean up, you know, <laughs> the streets uh, around them and so on. It was a whole new way of rallying or protesting, you know. It was just being peaceful and making our voices heard. And people were ready for that. And let me tell you something about timing. You need to make sure when you're going to call such a rally, your timing is perfect. If your timing is perfect, in other words, you must be able to read the ground. If your timing is good, your numbers will come up. So you can see every time the Bursi rallies were called, the timing was right. How do you judge the mood on the ground then? You know, by talking to people, by reading what is written, and there is a general air of despondency. People are very fed up with the way things are being run. And of course, you know, when you have bully boys uh, okay. in authority, right. yeah, that's a very good signal. When they need to push back on you so much, then you know that you're doing the right thing. Okay? Yeah. But of course, when you were doing all this, uh, uh, there's pushback, right? There's pushback by authorities, etc. And you're running your firm, right? Uh, as a commercial firm, doing commercial work, you got to go to court. And the perception, particularly during those days, was, you know, the judiciary is a particularly conservative. You must have lost clients in it. Ambe. I did. I, I think uh, that 
is where I was affected. And because I was seen as anti-government. Mm. So without a doubt, I was affected. And I can only thank my colleagues in the firm, actually, who helped me carry the firm uh, because it affected them too. You know, my partners, et cetera. And, and not many partners will hang around, right? Uh, and, and wait. So without a doubt, uh, Razlan, I think that was one of the disadvantages. But I did not, uh, let me say this, in court, I was never treated differently mm. by the judges. No. So, so the client's concerns, as far as you're concerned, is just a perception. But in terms of how judges treated you, it was as, as per normal. As per normal. As per normal. Right. Well, when you talk about, uh, the, the, of course, your, your partners, yeah, um, having carrying the brand of the firm, but of course, there's also a personal cost to this as well. How did your, your family, particularly your, you know, your middle class, non-revolutionary family feels, felt about this? Oh, they were, yeah, that, they were really, really worried. Okay. Especially the first time this occurred and they were against it completely. Uh, and I, oh, I, I see. Say, yes, I have to say they gave me a little bit of a hard time, but I, I did ignore them because you see, at some point, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you see, I can, I, I find it difficult to ignore go past the universe, but yeah, carry on. <laughs> but because you see, once you take on something like this, you cannot turn back ever. You don't do it otherwise because there are too many people who are depending on you. And the minute you show weakness and you turn back, the cause suffers. The government, you know, the authorities have won. So there, there is no way, once you're in, you're in 110%. And actually, closer to the time you're in a different zone, you don't even hear the, the voices that are telling you, you can't do this. Okay. And I think after a while, uh, my family realized, ah, well, just let her do what she wants because we don't think we can. <laughs> I, think, I think that was the, that was the feeling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, uh, of course, um, you know, uh, that you just said there, there was certain, I suppose, uh, financial price to pay uh, for your activism as well because, you know, you lost clients. But on the other hand, did you, uh, find occasions where your leadership or Brissé particularly gives, you know, any advantage to you? Uh, in a case or anything like that? Well, you know, um, I can only, I can think of one instance. I'm not even sure whether it was an advantage, but it's a funny story. Um, but I was doing a trial in Penang. Uh, I won't mention the lawyer on the other side, but he's a very dear friend. And it was a banking matter. And uh, what happened was, this was, I think it must have been just after one of the rallies. It, it happened over a period of time. But on that particular day, I was due to cross-examine some of the uh, officers in, in the bank and uh, or the witnesses of the bank. And when I arrived uh, and the witnesses saw me, they immediately whispered to their lawyer and said, uh, basically, can we take a photograph with her? <laughs> you, were the, you were the opponent, right? <laughs> yes, I was the opponent. <laughs> okay, okay. So All my right. friend who was the counsel was like, oh, oh, what am I going to do with this? So okay. took photographs with me. And then after Good. that, they sat in the box and I had to cross-examine them. That's not very, right. very easy, by the way, because they were smiling okay. at me and, you know, okay. it was not very easy. Um, and the other side lawyer said to me, oh, my goodness me, what does this mean, you know, to my case? <laughs> so that was one of the delightful moments, okay? And, uh, yeah, so it was, it was fine. I mean, it, it proceeded. But that's one of the ways in which I suppose – it affected some of my trials, but uh, yeah. Positively, positively. Did, did, positively, did, yeah. Did, they settle, did they settle the case with you then? No, no, they didn't. They didn't. We <laughs> <No, no, no. laughs> <laughs> fought it through. I see. So that was one of the incidents. All right. Okay, the thing is this, you know, uh, I did just a quick search uh, on your latest cases as reported in one of these legal journals website. He ran the whole gamut from contract Damages as to commission claims, judicial review when you're acting for trade union. There were some trust cases. There was a banking case as well. And of course, there was a, uh, some constitutional cases. Could I ask, was, is your approach to all these cases, is there a common theme when you, when it comes to you preparing these different type of cases? Okay. 
there's also quite a lot of public interest litigation. Uh, oh, yes, of there. course. All right. Yeah. So preparation for me is the same for every case. As counsel, you should be able to take on any brief. Of course, there are some areas I won't touch because it does require a level of expertise. And I would rather not uh, go there and leave it to those who are experts in the field. But as far as preparation is concerned, obviously, there's a difference from trial between trial, the court of appeal and the federal court. Each of them, the preparation for each of them, the preparation is different. I love trials, actually, to be honest. And I love the cross-examination part. Now, that is what I give my most attention to. For me, it takes a long time. For me, it takes a long time to prepare my cross-examination questions. And it's a lonely, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a lonely exercise. It's just you and the documents and, of course, the witness statements and so on and so forth. And I always feel that you must master every document because in cross-examination, you just don't know what the answer sometimes is going to be. And if you've read the documents carefully, you will know, ah, in this other document, he said something different. And then you can go to the witness. So there is no substitute for knowing every single document when you do a trial. Well, actually, when you do any case, whether it's court of appeal or federal court, but in a trial particularly, and particularly for cross-examination. So, it, yeah, sorry, in, in a trial context that when you prepare, do you actually prepare a set of questions or do you have particular just, you know, for this witness, these are the areas I'm going to touch on and you just have, you know, a general area? Okay, what I do is, for me, the areas are more important than, than the actual questions right. that you ask because I do write down questions but very often I find when I'm on my feet, I change them. Mm. I change them. Oh, I see. So for me, the, 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 what is important are the areas because I will never miss those. Those have to be in big block <laughs> letters. Okay. okay. Then right. your questions, right. you right. see, it never, when you prepare, over prepare on questions. And I'm saying, I'm not saying don't do it. Please do it. I do it as well, but be prepared to, change it around because of the way the, the responses come because of the way, you know, that, that you think the point should be made. So that happens to me. It may not happen to anyone else, but that's how I do it under clear headings as to different areas. And, and honestly, before you start any case, whether it is trial, it is court of appeal or federal court, it is a really good idea after you've read all the documents to put, your things down and to think. Think about the case because for the court of appeal, all right, for example, you need an angle. What is it that is going to capture the minds of the judges so that they are interested in your appeal? And of course, federal court is even more difficult, right? Right. So thinking is a vital part of that process. And, and you can think when you're having a shower, whatever it is, or you can think in your room when it's quiet, but think about the file. Think about the case and how you're going to pitch it so that it captures the imagination of the bench. So in your case, it's not really a market, you know, I mean, of course, there's the hard work of preparing, but the way I hear you answer, uh, Ambi, it's not, a really a, it's not just a mechanistic approach. You, whilst you're preparing, at the back of your mind, I think you are also thinking, what is the angle? How do I pitch it? You know, where am I coming from? So on and so forth. I mean, yes. all right. Frankly, that, that must be really tiring, isn't it? Not really, because you see, I'm a big believer in the subconscious mind. Okay. Okay. All right. I mean, which is why you need, you cannot prepare just the day before. Oh, you of actually, yeah. Need, yeah. You actually need to absorb it, right? And to, and, and I'm not saying, of course, I, that I, that hasn't happened to me, okay? But I'm right. just saying, ideally, you need to absorb it, and then you find your mind, all right, churning it around, and you're coming up with new ideas. And suddenly you say, ah, I should actually look at this. Ah, I should look at that. So mm. I don't think that's tiring. I think that is your mind uh, working, right. and, and you can't have your mind working, yeah. Uh. I mean, just following on from that, just uh, two aspects that I'm, I'm interested in, in in terms of the work that you do. 
the first is, let me ask you about the scholarship in terms of uh, studying of the, of the law, of the cases. Does that, is that a big factor in the way you prepare? Or are your, do your cases tend to be very fact-based and the law is pretty much settled and tried? So that's the first, first question. Second question I have is in respect of the types of intellectual property cases you do. Particularly, I'm interested in the patent cases. Uh, these cases are technical from a legal perspective, but they're also technical from an industrial and an engineering perspective. So how do you tackle that second half? Okay, thank you. You know, N.H. Chan, formerly Court of Appeal judge, always used to say that very often the facts speak for themselves. Okay, so the law is key, of course. You must know what the law is. But it is your facts that are going to, to me, in many of the cases that I've done, the facts are really going to be what determine the outcome or, you know, um, but you must also be, before you prepare, you must have an idea what the law is, obviously, and uh, what it is you're trying to get to. So, but I am very, a very fact person, let me tell you that, Okay. And so when you do things like uh, trademark infringement, for example, someone who's ripped off a trademark and so on and so forth, you're dealing with people who are not 100%, you know, honest in that sense, who are sailing very close to the wind, okay? Don't speak about my clients like that, Ambi. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you, you, you know, so the facts there would speak louder than anything else, right? Because right, right. Uh, if you if you're copying, you're copying. You know, if you're not, you're not. So that influences the the judges. So that's on 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 that first question, uh, Gopal. I'm not sure I answered that fully. But patent cases. Okay, I have, uh, and I I will say in my firm, my partner is really uh, the person who who deals with all of the patent cases. But I've also argued them. Now, this is why I say IP. It's so wide-ranged, all right? Um, you have to know about sometimes oil rigs. Uh, you have to know about uh, the simplest of inventions, you know? You have to understand how things are put together industrially, whether there's the kind of joining. It's like the kind of things that you have to learn, okay, is incredible. The way you make sense of it all is, of course, using experts, that's what you need. <coughs> you are not the expert in many of these areas. So you have to rely on your experts. But you yourself have to understand how something works. Because if you don't, you will be unable to argue how it infringes. Uh, so it's very tough. And that's why... You have specialist uh, benches in 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 uh, the uh, UK and all that who deal with patents because honestly, sometimes if you look at a chemical patent, now I haven't done a chemical patent yet, is very complex. You need you know chemists, you need um, and and of course for others you need engineers, you need real experts to explain it to you. So patent trials are bigger, they're big, they take much longer. Preparation is much, much more complex. So it's, it's a special kind of litigation, actually. I, I suppose the challenge there uh, uh, is to understand the expert and thereafter to uh, explain it in the simplest possible way so that the judges would understand, isn't it? And although that sounds simple, that's very, very difficult to do. Have your style changed, Abi, over the years in doing this stuff in terms of interpreting experts' reports and then translating it into language a judge or you and I can understand? Right. You see, um, it is not easy to explain to judges who are not familiar with uh, mm. technical terms. But patent law is not the only one. Who has uh, who deal has to deal with experts and and deal with such complex issues? Um, but yes, the kind of advocacy you do for that is different. Um, 
you cannot oversimplify because that, to me, that is misleading. If you oversimplify without totally appreciating the technical aspects, then that is something that, that would not be right. So you cannot oversimplify a complex pattern, for example. But you need, you use charts, okay? Now you can use computers. Uh, recently, we used videos. And it isn't, the judges are very attentive and they want to understand it themselves before they make their decision. So, and the high court judge has the most difficult task there because on the court of appeal, it's, you know, uh, yeah, they rely on yeah. the findings of the, so, but a lot of times I find that once they decide this is expert is the preferred uh, explanation or, or another, they then just go with that. So that's why you find in pattern judgments, you will get pictures of the, of the parts or you will get pictures. Yeah, you, you've seen that before. Yeah. So you, you've been doing this for almost 40 years now, and you just said earlier, particular areas that you love most is, is you know, try work. And I'm just thinking of the old adage of never ask a question you don't know the answer to. I mean, do you still follow this? Oh, this? It's, it's a very good rule. That is a very good rule. But what I have learned with my experience, you have a certain instinct sometimes a certain instinct that tells you go for it okay even though you don't know the answer go for it because okay you know, so you will you will go for it huh? i have okay i have right. not very often so okay. I, I don't recommend it okay but it's after many many years of doing trial okay, okay. Uh, you do get an instinct that sometimes you go for it and actually it has been quite successful and i haven't done it often let me also say that <laughs> Has it uh, actually turned back and turned you back? No, actually, it, it oh, worked okay. uh, in right. a couple of yeah, in the few instances that I did. So, <laughs> yes, but again, as I say, it's your instinct as a trial lawyer. You know, you know that you're just there at that <laughs> at that moment. Yeah, and you've got to yeah. make a snap decision whether you're going to push it one step further. And most of the time, you should not. Um, so I would leave it to, to each lawyer to determine when that's the right time. Sorry, Razan, let me just quote from uh, David Maxwell Fife, who is the British prosecutor in um, the Nuremberg War Crimes Trial. Okay. And he said of Justice Robert Jackson, who had just finished cross-examining uh, Gold Goering, that Jackson lacked the sixth sense of the cross-examiner, which subconsciously anticipates the workings of the witness's mind. Is that what you're talking about, Abhi? That's probably what I'm talking about without appreciating it. <laughs> that it, that it was. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but you know, when you're a new advocate and all, it's good to stick by those rules, by the way. <laughs> yes, yes, I know. As a first year advocate, I ignored that rule completely and turned up and it turned around and beat me in. <laughs> but you know, the uh, best questions, the best questions in cross examination are where either answer is good for you. There oh, yes. are those questions. You know, yes. yeah, those are the best questions. That, that, <laughs> Get a that, few that, of that, that in and build your correct. confidence with that. Yeah. <laughs> correct. I mean, you describe your, you know, your preparation and all that for trial and your love for cross examination. But clearly, doing appellate work, something else entirely, isn't it? I mean, preparation for the court of appeal or the approach to be taken to federal court must must necessarily be different. Could you just uh, talk to us a bit on on cases at the appellate level, at the court of appeal, or and at the high court? Uh, sorry, at the federal court? Yes, certainly. In, in a trial, obviously, everything is dynamic. Anything can happen. Uh, and that's what the charm of trials is, that you, you, you can prepare, but you also have to prepare for, the, uh, for, for things that you may not have prepared for. All right. So uh, what I would say is this. Of course, a trial is, is a completely different process from the appellate process. In a trial, it's dynamic. Okay. You can prepare as much as you want, but you may not be able to foresee all the eventualities and all the things that are going to happen. You really, literally have to think on your feet. Now, when you go up to the, uh, to the Court of Appeal, then you are arguing on record. Okay. And right. I have found that if I've done the trial, arguing the appeal is easier yeah. because you're familiar with the evidence. 
So on appeal, it is by way of rehearing. So you can be quite wide ranging in the arguments that you take and you can go into issues of fact. But obviously, you cannot bore the bench to tears. All right. Now, of course, you have written submissions and that is an art in itself. I'm not sure I've mastered that art. And I think the more brief you can be, the better. But it is the way in which you present the case in the Court of Appeal. If you are the appellant, don't forget, you have an advantage. You have the first speech and you have the last speech. That is a huge advantage. And that's why when I respond, I am concerned sometimes. Because who sets the stage? It's the appellant who sets the stage. You set the parameters. When you're responding, you are pulled into those parameters. When you respond, you may have to rethink those parameters and reset the parameters of your case. So again, as I say, that's the advantage of the first speech and the last speech. But the advocacy for appellant, respondent differs. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it is yep. capturing again the attention of the bench. You need to show why the high court judge went so very wrong in the decision. So that's where, again, your preparation is important. You're speaking from record, but you can't throw the whole lot at the bench and expect them to digest it. They didn't sit through the trial. So you need to pick up what is, is, uh, what, uh, what advances your case. Federal court, completely different again. Um, and I remember Justice, uh, uh, the former Chief Justice Melanjum saying, tell me your killer point. What's your killer point? Okay, in the federal yeah, court. So, yeah, that's right. He likes, he loves that. Quote, unquote. So yeah. that, that's what you need to think. And sometimes, and I have noticed, and, I, and that's why I say thinking is so important. It's such an important part of the process. In the federal court, you literally have to think out of the box sometimes because it's very easy for them to throw it out on saying it's facts, it's fact specific, et cetera, et cetera. You really need to think about the public importance. And by the way, I actually think it's too stringent in the federal court, okay, to get leave. Yeah. Because sometimes yeah. when you have high court deciding one way, court of appeal deciding one way, then, and you can't get to the, to the federal court, it's, it's, your last resort. So, yeah. Um, yeah. But nevertheless, because that's the law now, you need to really think of an angle, an angle that will get you into that uh, uh, public importance, uh, you know, uh, qualification. And you need to have more so than in the Court of Appeal, an angle which immediately makes the bench sit up and think, ah, yeah, there is some injustice here. There is some issue here that needs further ventilation. So for you, so you, that's how your, your, your submissions have to go. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying that I manage to do it every single time, but it is in my mind when I approach these cases. So that will mean basically the first 45 seconds or one minute of your speech. That is the hook. That's if the you hook. you can get them interested. Then, then of course you can then start to That's develop right. your argument. Isn't That's it? right. It's the hook. So do you, do you personally spend a lot of time perfecting the hook, so to speak? Yes, I do think about it a lot. And I, but as I say, I don't know if I succeed every time, but I <laughs> yeah, think course. about it a lot. And that's why you can never assume that your approach in each of the courts is the same. It's not. Hmm. Yeah. Well, of course you can't talk about, I suppose, Judges who's, who's, who's around yet. But, uh, in your 40 years now, almost 40 years at the bar, is there a, a particular judge in which if you know you're going to get him or her, you're particularly, I suppose, uh, excited in the period because you know this judge will understand or, or conversely, uh, is there other particular judges you say, Oh, good lord. What am I going to, what am I going to do? <laughs> you know? Yes. Um, I, I'll talk about the past because right. I, Obviously. I think it's yeah. not right to, yeah. But look, I was one, I was lucky enough to appear before uh, the late, great Yusufi Abdul Qadir and of course the late, great Sultan Azlan Shah. So 
they were real giants, okay? <laughs> and Yusufi Abdul Qadir would, you would be petrified to appear before him. But you knew that he knew his brief and that the questions he asked you were fair questions. I mean, he would put you down. But it was exciting to appear before judges who would actually challenge you. Yeah. So they were the judges. And of course, in the high court, as a junior uh, lawyer, we used to be petrified of Justice Razak, <laughs> you know, okay. uh, right. tough, tough that, judge. That, that's your, that's um, your client, isn't it? Yes, that's right. And <laughs> and, and also Justice Tansri B.C. George. Not, oh. not that you were afraid, but it's a it was a pleasure to appear oh. before him. And I remember one story, once when I went before him, I was very junior, arguing an injunction. And I was rustling with my authorities. And I said, the case of, and he said, he, he obviously noticed because it was in chambers. He said, you are not going to cite American cyanide to me. Are you, Mr. <laughs> Nivas? And he said, <laughs> and I quickly closed and I said, no, I'm not. <laughs> And then lovely <laughs> stories about him because he was so good humored, but you know, excellent judge. Some people and Justice Harun, born judges, you know, they right, were born, right. they had a temperament that was so judge like. I, I don't know how to put it any other way. So, yeah. so I had some wonderful moments, yes. Yes. Regarding counsels that you've had uh, as your opponents, yep, was there any a particular person who's who, who you felt was particularly tough, you know, and, and say, you know, I, I really don't want to go against this, this this person or that person. Okay, I, I've never felt that I didn't want to go against anyone. My my starting point is you don't underestimate anyone. Mm. Whether they are junior or they're senior, I never underestimate my opponent, ever. But you had opponents like, and of course, uh, again, the late, great uh, Karpal Singh, who, who never did, didn't do much, um, uh, many civil cases, but the right. occasion when I have appeared against him and I've watched him in court, he has such a way with the judges. Okay. Everything he, he knows how to make a complex point appear simple. They're the ones that I worry about. Okay. Because they reach the judges so quickly. All right. And they capture the imagination of the judges so quickly. So for you to then bring them back to your point of view. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The other one was uh, K.S. Narayanan. One of the, Ah. again, the most complex point of law. He makes it so simple, you know. Uh, So those were the people that, that I would say were not easy to appear against because they enjoyed the confidence of the bench. And, and and this is the thing about preparation again, okay? I was talking about that earlier. The one thing you must build is trust with the bench to a point where when you say this is the law, they accept it because it's coming from you. Or if you say this is wrong, they accept it. Or these are the facts, they accept it. Of course, you make mistakes. And if you make mistakes, apologize immediately because we're human. We're bound to make mistakes. But when you build up that trust, and that is what people like Karpal Singh and, and, and others had. So they build up this trust with the bench. And that is what we must seek to do from day one. From day one. You do not mislead on cases. You do not mislead on facts. If you make a mistake, which is human, you apologize. For me, that is absolutely critical. To build up a career at the bar. Uh, Gopal, do you have anything to add? I do. I've uh, just got a few questions, Abhi. Um, let me ask you about lawyers you've worked with or lawyers you've worked against. Who, what would be, who would be the one name you would cite as the person who inspired you? Okay, that's. Uh, I have to think about that. <laughs> you've got to give me a no minute problem. on that. Take your time. No, there are, there are a few, actually. As I said, Karpal... Well, the one who truly inspired me, uh, Gopal, would be Raja Aziz. Okay? Raja Aziz, who never overstated a principle, passionate about what was right, a wonderful leader at the bar. So he was, to me, the complete package. Always straightforward with the bench, always had the respect of the bench. He inspired a lot 
of what I learned. You know, he inspired a lot of how I, the kind of lawyer I became. He would be one of them, definitely. And he would be the person I think I would name as the person who inspired me. And continues to inspire me, by the way, because I know, I still say, and I think I have said it to you, Gops, what would Raja Aziz do in a situation like this? When I ask that question, it's his name I use. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and can I just say, you're not the only interviewee yes. who has um, signed yeah. him as, as really? in that context. Yes, well, that there context. you are. Let me now turn to your, your advocacy in the streets, as you, as you call it. That's led to a number of opportunities that you've, you've had, including uh, meeting politicians internationally. Uh, you've met presidents of the United States, you've met secretaries of state, you've met prime ministers. Who stood out for you amongst those, that group of people, politicians? Who stood out for you? Okay, I didn't meet presidents, actually. I met the Secretary of State, of course, the U.S. Secretary of State. I thought you met, you met, you met Obama, President Obama, haven't you? No, uh, President, oh, sorry, yes. Yes. Here in Kuala Lumpur, I That's had, That's right, yes. yeah, yeah. So who, who stood out of, of the leaders that I met? I would say it was Hillary Clinton and Michelle Obama. Of course, Michelle Obama at the material time was the wife of the president. But they really stood out for me. Also because they were women who were standing up for what was right and that they were, they were using their position as women to also empower other women. That was important for me. So I would say uh, both of them, actually. Now, you know, you've got your career both as an activist. I know the last few years, your career at the bar has, has been extremely busy. Do you see yourself still straddling both those worlds going forward? Or do you see yourself focusing on one rather than the other? Uh, well, now I, I find myself focusing, of course, almost entirely on my professional work. But being me, I can't also stay out of <laughs> what's going on in the country because, you see, having been bitten by the bug uh, many years ago and having been part of or a very small part of the process of change, which was actually you attribute to the people, uh, and having been amongst Malaysians of all walks of life who are so passionate about this country, it is difficult not to be still interested in what's going on, you know, in the politics of the country. You can never not be interested. And I think people are so engaged after the last elections in the process, the political process, that, you know, because they were so much a part of bringing change in this country, it is not something you can, you can ignore. So without a doubt, I, I am more uh, focusing on, on my profession, uh, no doubt about that. But I will still be engaged in what's going on in the country. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, um, thank you very much, Ambika. Thank you for spending that uh, hour with us. Uh, it's been illuminating. Uh, yes. And it's been an absolute pleasure. Yes, it, 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 was, it was brilliant. Thank you for listening. And please keep a lookout for our next episode featuring Jonathan Crow QC. In the meantime, we would love it if you could leave a review on our podcast channels and follow us on our social media platforms. Bye. Listen to the voices of the adverse.